Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Today's Sabbath School lesson is Longing for More. And with us is Barbara and Scott, and myself, Byron, to do the lesson for this week. But before we do any of that, we have to invite the most important person, and that's the Holy Spirit. So, Scott, could you open us in prayer? Certainly. Dear Lord, we come before you today to um, ask you for your Holy Spirit. And Father, we're longing for more love for each other, for more knowledge about you, longing for more uh, understanding in our hearts for everyone and for um, your soon coming. Um, we ask you that you help us to understand this lesson and to live it in our own lives. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Scott. Okay, so we're going to look at the memory verse here, um, 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now these things happen as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. So the title for Hebrews chapter 10 is, Avoid Israel's Mistakes. What mistakes were they? First, they didn't enter into the promised land because of their unbelief, their lack of faith. In Hebrews 10, it talks about how they all ate the same spiritual food, that would be the manna from heaven, all drank from the same spiritual rock, that, or drink, that would be the rock at Mount Sinai, and were baptized into Moses through the parting of the Red Sea. They all saw the miracles in Egypt and everything God had done, but they still had doubts in their hearts. They still never trusted the Lord completely. Now, there is a valuable lesson for us today. Now, let us look more at these examples or models that the lesson mentions and how they can help us to be or in the Bible to better understand God's ways and character. The Bible contains types, patterns, symbols, and shadows. For instance, in Exodus 32, 31 through 32. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out of your book, which you have written. And that would be the book of life. Here, Moses is a type of Christ. And there's a type and an anti-type. The anti-type is what it's relating to. So Christ would be the antitype. Moses offers his life to save the people of Israel. In the same way, Jesus offered his life up to save everyone in the world. There are patterns and shadows as well. Hebrews 8, 5, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So we look at this, a shadow and a pattern of what is in heaven. And we know that the sanctuary is a copy of what is in heaven, but not nearly as grand. Let's put it that way. But also we see a pattern. And if we want to go off the beaten track a little bit here, we see a pattern of salvation in the tabernacle. The sinner comes to the tabernacle courtyard seeking God. And as the priest washed or cleansed themselves in the laver before entering the holy place, so the repenting sinner is baptized and washed or cleansed of their sins to enter the holy place. In the holy place, the new believer finds the table of showbread, which is the word of God consuming it daily as he grows and is nourished by God's word. Also, there's the menorah, the lampstand, which contains oil, which the, is the Holy Spirit that dwells in the new believer, so that, God put, so that God's light may shine to others through him. And we have the altar of incense, which is the, um, the smoke ascending to heaven. We know that symbolizes prayer to, prayers to God in heaven. It is prayer and supplication that also transforms the new believer into more of the character of God. This communing with God is essential in the new believer's life and growth. 
all of these things transform the new believer into a character of Christ Jesus and prepare him for the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant resides, which is glorification. Simply put, this means that you're ready to go home with Jesus when he comes. This is a very truncated version of the sanctuary message to salve, or message for salvation. We could spend weeks thoroughly studying it, but you get the point. There's all these micro or examples that point to something bigger in the Bible. So the title of this week's lesson is Longing for More. So what does any of this have to do with longing for more? All these types and symbols, etc. So let's go back to the Israelites that did enter the promised land. They were good with God, right? We read in Hebrews 4, 8, and 9, For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of any other, another of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath, rest for the people of God. But it looks like they weren't really having that complete rest from God. So what kind of rest is he talking about? The Israelites that entered Canaan, where they weren't missing out on anything, were they? Obviously, they had the physical rest, but there was still that relationship. And we see this on the apostasy that repeated itself over and over in Israel. So what were they looking for? And can, we can read in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You could also say that you're resting God, because they're the same. So how do we find that peace of God, that contentment and rest? In John 5, 39 and 40, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and that's Jesus speaking, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So basically in the scripture, we will find these answers. And for today's lesson, we'll look and see how we can find this elusive rest that the lesson is referring to, especially on the Sabbath day when we commune with God. So Scott, can you tell us about Monday's lesson, being baptized into Moses? Certainly. Well, I, I thought before we even start our lesson, I'll, I'll uh, bring up Moses' name, which Moses' name literally means to draw out of water. Uh, so his very name symbolized the, the baptism, and it was sort of a, as well a, an initiation or a baptism of the entire Hebrew people. So let's start off with reading the, um, the verses for, for today's lesson, which is 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and they passed through the sea and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea and they all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for their dead bodies were spread out in the wilderness. Now the same things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they indeed craved them. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up and play. Nor are we to commit sexual immorality as did some of them, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor are we to put the Lord to the test, as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. Nor to grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroyer. Now these things happen as an example that they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So, um, some interesting parts here. One was that these three things that, um, and, and actually four things that um, Paul talks about as bad examples would be things to avoid were idolatry, sexual immorality, and putting God to the test, which ironically, or maybe not so ironically, were the exact three 
temptations that Christ was um, was tempted with by Lucifer himself in the wilderness after he had fasted for 40 days. So Christ's three temptations were, number one was uh, on appetite when he was told to turn the stones into bread. And so Christ said, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. The second one was to, uh, he was tempted to um, worship Satan, which would be uh, essentially idolatry. Uh, and the third one, he was putting God to the test, telling him he should jump from a high, uh, high pinnacle of the temple. And then he mentions grumbling, and that could be a fourth thing. Uh, so essentially the same things that uh, the people of Israel failed at accomplishing these three tests were the things that Christ passed. And as uh, during the Old Testament um, wandering in the wilderness, one man's sin, Achan, uh, could prevent them from entering the promised land. So during the New Testament, one man's righteousness, which is Christ, could help them enter into the heavenly Canaan. So, And then as far as the baptism model, um, as they were going through the Red Sea, Paul is equating that with a form of baptism, which is in the New Testament. So um, let's see what, it, what they, the, the lesson says here. The Greek term used in Corinthians 10 sips um, is translated as an example most as typos, which is a type or of a Greek noun. Um, it is never the original, but some kind of representation of it. So that is in, in order for God to have us understand what he's talking about, he needs to use types or symbols. And then in Hebrew 8.5 is a good example of this type of relationship. They, that is the priests of the Old Testament service, serve as a copy of the shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Um, this passage in Hebrews highlights the direct link between the heavenly and the earthly realities. And then it quotes Exodus 25, 9, where God told Moses to build in the wilderness a sanctuary according to the pattern that he has seen on the mountain. The point is that earthly sanctuary, with all its rituals and procedures, were examples or symbols and models of what is going on to heaven, with Jesus as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. With this in mind, we can better understand what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 10. In these verses, Paul revisits some of the key experiences of God's people in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And now I'm going to take a little divergence, but it seemed like almost every story in the Old Testament had something to do with um, the typology that, or the, with the things that were fulfilled in the New Testament. For instance, when he was giving them manna in the wilderness. In fact, one of the Pharisees even asked Christ, what sign do you give us? Because our fathers ate manna. So Christ said, I am the bread of life. So Christ himself became that symbol of the bread. And he was also uh, not just the bread, but he was also the, the wine. Um, in fact, he was also the living water. So when he sta uh, talked to the Samaritan woman at the well, um, the way he got her to be interested in what he had to teach was by using the analogy of the water. Uh, so she's like, Christ told her, well, if you drank of the, of the water that I have to offer you, you would never thirst again. Well, she's like, oh, that would be fantastic. I'd like some water. Uh, when Christ then moves things to a spiritual part, saying that the water that I have to offer you is the water of salvation, which is his blood which was shed for us. So I think um, the lesson here talks about that. So Paul considers these important stations of the wilderness journey as a type or example of the individual baptisms. In the footsteps of Paul's logic, his reference to spiritual food refers to manna. Um, all right. And then I think I already brought up the living water. So thus, nearly every example that um, was given in the Old Testament was also reused in the New Testament. 
And so the same things, themes are used to teach us a lesson about how to follow the good example of things that were done well in the past and also how to avoid their mistakes. So with that, we'll move on to... Well, and just real quick, you could almost say everything in the, new, or in the Old Testament as a type pointing to salvation and Jesus in the New Testament, yet the New Testament itself is the revealing of all those types so that we can actually see in the two, as we always know, are all intertwined. So, right. And I was just thinking that it would take a, a beyond human intelligence to make everything fit so, ni so neatly together. Because the Bible has 66, oh, I mean 66 books and about 40 authors. So for 40 authors to agree so tightly to, um, to have their stories meshed together so well, I don't think has ever been achieved anywhere else in any other literature. Right. Yeah. Amen. Barbara, what can you tell us about Monday and ritual and sacrifices? Well, I'm going to pick up and kind of feed off of what Scott talked about as all of the typo typology that went on in the Old Testament that reflected Christ in the New Testament. But we're going to look at rituals and sacrifices that centered around the sanctuary. Remember in Psalm 77:13, King David says, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary, who is so great a God as our God. So the sanctuary is the core of heaven and earth. And we see that in Exodus, and Scott mentioned this, where we see that uh, Exodus 25:40. And to see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So when Moses made the sanctuary on earth, it was a pattern after what was in heaven. And then Hebrews 8.5 says, Who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So we see these, um, so we see this pattern of things from heaven. So God's sanctuary, this core is part of God's governance from before man. And so we know that, that in heaven, God had the sanctuary. And the Old Testament system was built of rituals and sacrifices. And we find this, a lot of this in Leviticus where we see um, more historic examples. The Old Testament symbols pointing to New Testament truths. Though modern readers of the Bible often pass over these rituals, they do contain many important spiritual truths that can be of great value when we study them. And I just want to point out that you don't see a lot of churches studying this philosophy today. You see it, though, as one of the core studies in the Adventist faith. So the book of Leviticus contains most of the prescriptions about offerings and sacrifices. So in addition to the sin offering, which we're going to read about in a minute, <clears throat> some of the offerings included libations involving oil and wine that were poured out before God. We see that in Exodus uh, 29. Uh, flour and grain offerings you see in Leviticus too. Plus, there are other offerings that were, were set up. Peace offerings, uh, offerings regarding relationships, thank offerings. And all these principles were part of their core values in the Old Testament. And all of these rituals were shown, we see throughout the Bible, and, and reflect to Christ in the New Testament and how we come to him. Also, we see the implements of the sanctuary like the candlesticks, the showbread, the incense, the ark. All of these implements all relate to our spiritual lives. The oil and the candlesticks, the bread of life, Christ, the altar of incense, our prayers, and of course, the ark, the law that was from God. And his law um, was the key, the centerpiece of the whole sanctuary. Um, so let's jump now and read the instructions given to the Israelites for a sin offering. 
in Leviticus 4, 32 through 35. If he brings a lamb as a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. Then he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering, kill it as a sin offering, and place it at offering at the place where they kill the burnt offering. So the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar. He will remove all its fat as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering. Then the priest shall burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire to the Lord. So the priest shall make atonement for his sin that he has committed and it shall be given him. So we see that this lamb that was brought to the altar was a, a lamb without blemish, just as Christ was the lamb of God without blemish. So we see that, that this happening. But it's interesting, this lamb was a lamb that was one of the first lambs. So this was, these were special lambs. These weren't just part of the group. These were, part, these were lambs that were set aside for God. And so you would see that that these lambs had special significance within the family. And so it was difficult when they had to sacrifice it, and they had to literally sacrifice it themselves. They had to lean on the lamb and complete the sacrifice, which was painful for the sinner. So and now if we fast forward to Christ's time, we see in John 1.29 a visual image when John that John sees Jesus coming, and it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And we see something similar in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He is indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Indeed, when we read through the biblical injunctions of the Old Testament regarding sacrifice, it becomes clear God gave very specific details about what could be sacrificed and about when, where, and what ritual was to proceed and or follow. Central to many of the rituals, of course, was blood from the spilling of the sprinkling of blood. This was not pretty, nor was it supposed to be, because it was dealing with the ugliest thing in the universe, and that is sin. While most rituals associated with the sanctuary appear in perspective forms, they give instructions on how to do it. They do not always include the explanations. And often, then, I think the explanations would help us more today, but then they saw them happening in real time. So they understood the significance. They understood that when the blood ceased to flow, there was no more life. And Leviticus 17:11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And so I want to give you an example <clears throat> taken from Leviticus 4, 32 through 35. However, contains... Oh, excuse me. How, that, however, this explanation in Leviticus, the priest makes the atonement for the sin he has committed, and it shall be forgiven him. So as we look further down the line on the Day of Atonement, we see even more symbolism. And I think of that blood-stained cord that was dripped, dipped in the blood right. and put around the doors that turned white when the sanctuary was cleansed. And that's what Christ does in our life with that blood. It, once we have 
had our for sins forgiven, then our slates are clean and white. And so I just wanted to read to you then one last thing as we finish up this today's lesson from um, the commentary, and it's Ellen White's comment. Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. To many, it has been a mystery why so many sacrificial offerings were required in the old dispensation, why so many bleeding victims were led to the altar. But the great truth that was to be kept before men and imprinted upon the mind and heart was this, without shedding of blood there is no remission. In every bleeding sacrifice was typified the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Christ himself was the originator of the Jewish system of worship in which by types and symbols were shadowed forth spiritual and heavenly things. Many forgot the true significance of these offerings and the great truth that through Christ alone there is forgiveness of sin has been lost to many. And we see that today. All right, and there's so many types to look for. My favorite is actually um, when Jesus was sacrificed, the Paschal Lamb, right, at Passover, mm -hmm. and how that was a symbol of their freedom from slavery in Egypt and how he saves us from slavery to sin. But as we move to Tuesday, an example of rest. So what is this rest that they're always talking about that we're looking for? It's definitely not the Sabbath rest that we're normally accustomed to, I don't believe. So I'm going to read Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Let's start there. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in the passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. He again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David after so long a time, just as has been or had been said before, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given him rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Oh, that's a lot. But let's take a look at this. First, let's look at what we know to do and not to do from that passage in God's rest. For example, on Sabbath, we always start off with the rules, right? When you're a new believer. And then you learn to honor God, and then you do it because you love God, and you don't want to displease Him. You do it out of your love. So let's start with, first of all, you need to hear the good news. You need to hear the gospel. That's a requirement. The second point is, then we are warned to not have disbelief. Hence, we need to believe the good news or the gospel that we've heard. Three, number three, a stumbling block is disobedience, and that's in verse six. So we must be obedient to God's instructions and trust that he knows what he's doing. Number four, the next obstacle is hardening our hearts. This will not only disqualify you from partaking in God's rest, it's a sure path to grieving the Holy Spirit, which is the only unpardonable sin. This rest cannot come from any man, as it, uh, only God can give it. And that's stated in verses 8 and 9. And we must rest from our worldly works that we might give God all of our attention, especially on Sabbath. So I wanted to pick one person in the Bible that would be a good example of entering into this rest. 
So I chose Nicodemus. Nicodemus first visits Jesus in chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And we don't have time to read all of that, but he comes to Jesus at night to speak to him. He comes in secret at first. Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 171, that's chapter 17. I highly advise if you get a chance to read all of chapter 17 on Nicodemus. Nicodemus had come to the Lord thinking to enter into a discussion with him. But Jesus laid bare the foundation principles of truth. He said to Nicodemus, it is not theoretical knowledge. You need so much as spiritual regeneration. You need not to have your curiosity satisfied, but to have a new heart. You must receive a new life from above before you can appreciate heavenly things. Until this change takes place, making all things new, it will result in no saving good for you to discuss with me my authority or my mission. Oh, Jesus said it, and Nicodemus, he was truly seeking God when he came to speak to Jesus, but God tell, or Jesus tells him exactly what he needs to change in his life. The next step, now Nicodemus is getting bolder. We read in John 7, 45 through 52, the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? This is when they ordered him to arrest Jesus in the temple. The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? Now one of the rulers of the Pharisees had believed in him. Had, or, I'm sorry, no one of the rulers of the Pharisees or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. This is the Pharisee speaking. Nicodemus he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? I love it. Nicodemus is working from the inside, trying to help Jesus. They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. But you see Nicodemus trying to make somewhat of a stand for Jesus here. He's getting bolder towards Christ, towards God's word. And in John 19, 1 through, or 38 through 40, we read, and this is, I would call this Nicodemus's final conversion. And this is after Jesus is crucified. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Nicodemus, that's why I say he's fully converted, he's just committed career suicide. All the status, all the prestige, the membership in the Sanhedrin is all gone. He's standing firm for God. And Ellen White writes in Desire of Ages, once again in page 177, After the Lord's ascension, when the disciples were scattered by persecution, Nicodemus came boldly to the front. He employed his wealth in sustaining the infant church that the Jews had expected to be blotted out at the death of Christ. In the time of peril, he who had been so cautious and questioning was firm as a rock, encouraging the faith of the disciples and furnishing means to carry forward the work of the gospel. He was scorned and persecuted by those who had paid him reverence in other days. He became poor in this world's goods, yet he faltered not in the faith which had its beginnings in that night conference with Jesus. And so we see in the beginning, Nicodemus, in the beginnings of the, Nicodemus' transformation, that night when he came to Jesus, we see the faith and boldness grow over time at the temple, and we see his commitment to our Lord and Savior at his death. He heard the good news. 
He was a teacher, but he heard the good news that night with Jesus. He believed. He was obedient. He didn't harden his heart like the other Pharisees, and he relied on God for all things. I read this, and I'm telling you that Nicodemus had that rest in God. He was worldly poor in the end, but spiritually rich beyond measure. So what kind of rest do we have, especially on Sabbath? Are you leading a God-focused, Holy Spirit-driven life? Something to think about. Something to think about and something to focus on if you truly want rest, true rest in the Lord. Scott, can you tell us about Wednesday, Harden Not Your Hearts? Certainly. So, Harden Not Your Hearts. Uh, one, one song that came to mind, there's a song that Amy Grant sings which says, the same sun that uh, melts the wax will harden clay. So I think our encouragement, we should be like wax, not like clay. So then I thought of some examples, both in the Old and New Testaments, of people who hardened their hearts. For example, in the Old Testament, we had Pharaoh who hardened his heart. Because it says that, so essentially the more powerful the miracles that God was um, performing on behalf of Israel, the more he hardened his heart until, of course, he himself, well, first his son, and then he himself was destroyed. Um, and this, the example in the New Testament would be the Jewish leaders who rejected Christ. And then in the Old Testament, we do have an example of a world ruler who did ultimately um, melt under God's, um, should we say, chastisements, and that was Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar, unlike Pharaoh, decided to submit to God's will and not to uh, oppose him. And I, I personally believe Nebuchadnezzar will likely be in heaven, even though maybe his descendants. Um, we're sure Belshazzar is not making it. Or, uh, so his the writing's on the wall. The, the one with the writing on the wall. I don't think he's we've making been told it. Told you're left wanting. Probably not <laughs> no. so much. But um, Nebuchadnezzar at least was willing to humble himself. Um, though it did take seven years of him eating grass. Um, and then in the New Testament example, somebody who melted under God's, um, shall we say, uh, direction or chastisement was Paul. So he was a persecutor of the Christians who became a, uh, probably the strongest proponent of Christianity during his time. Um, so then, uh, well, let's read a little bit here from the lesson. So it says, Hebrews 4, 4 through 7 quotes both the creation accounts and Psalms 95, uh, 11. So I, I won't reread the, um, the passage from Hebrews because Byron already read it. Uh, but I will go ahead and read Psalms 95, um, 6 through 11. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah and as of the day of Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test, they tested me, though they had seen my work. For forty years I was disgusted with that generation, and uh, said that they are people who err in their heart and who do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my angle, anger, they certainly shall not enter into my rest. <clears throat> and there's some interesting commentary as well from Alan White about, uh, about that passage, which is, Before God permitted them to enter Canaan, uh, they must show that they believed his promise. The water ceased before they had reached Edom. Here was an opportunity for them, for a little while, to walk by faith instead of by sight. But the first trial developed the same turbulent, unthankful spirit that had been manifested by their fathers. No sooner was the cry for water heard in the encampment that they forgot that the hand ha that had for so many years supplied their waters was instead of turning, uh, 
uh, supplied their wants, and instead of turning to God for help, they murmured against him in their desperation, exclaiming, Would God that we had died in our, um, when our brothers died in the, before the Lord. That was in Numbers 20, 1 to 3. That is, they wished <coughs> they had been of the number who were destroyed in the rebellion of Korah. And then it says, In their thirst the people had tempted God, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? If God has brought us here, why does he not give us water as well as bread? The unbelief thus manifested was criminal, and Moses feared that the judgments of God would rest upon them. And he called the name of the place Massa, that is temptation, <coughs> and Meribah, that means chiding, as a mem <coughs> memorial of their sin. Now, you know, we, we look back at Moses and think, how could such a honored leader of God, you know, not stick strictly to what God had spoke, told him to speak to the rock instead of striking the rock. Uh, but I can see Moses' frustrations. He's like, when your forefathers did the same thing, God made us wander in the wilderness for another 40 years. And I could think Moses thinking, I can't take another 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So yeah. I guess uh, from a human perspective, I can understand Moses' frustration with the fact that the children of the unbelieving fathers um, kind of were making the same mistakes again. So, um, continuing on with the lesson, it says, um, Of course, Israel did enter the promised land. A new generation crossed over the border and, with God's help, took the strongholds of the land and settled there. They did not, however, enter into God's rest, the idea being that many did not experience the reality of salvation in Jesus because their lack of faith was manifested by flagrant disobedience. Even though rest was associated with the land, it included more than just where the people lived. Then it says, Hebrew 4, 6 suggests that those who had heard the divine promise of true rest did not enter because of disobedience. What's the link between disobedience and not entering God's rest? So let's reread that 4.6. It says, Therefore, since it remains for some of them to enter it, and those who previously had good news preached to them, failed to enter because of disobedience. So, the, the application of that is that we are about to enter the heavenly Canaan, which is at the second coming of Christ, which comes either at the literal second coming or at the time of death, um, and none of us know when that could come. Uh, therefore, we need to heed these things today while there is still time. It says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So that is, do not be like Pharaoh or like the Jewish leaders in Christ's time. Uh, soften your hearts instead. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Consequently, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work, as God did from his. Therefore, let's make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following the same example of disobedience. So I think we'll end with that so that um, we need to be obedient and that is an absolute requirement to enter into God's rest. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Barbara, can you tell us about Thursday, conquering a heavenly city? We will, yes. And I, I, I want to follow up on what Scott just read to you, where Paul is talking about Joshua and how there must be another day because there still remained a, a day of rest for the people of God. So even though Joshua did lead the children of Israel into the promised land, there was still more in the way of rest. Now, the Jews had the Sabbath, didn't they? Yes. So they knew, they knew that there was rest. But they, didn't, they weren't able to achieve that complete spiritual rest. And I would like to suggest that part of it was due to their unbelief. Part of it was due to the fact that they weren't following God's guidance. They weren't keeping the Sabbath as God had intended for them to do. And throughout, we've seen 
<clears throat> we studied last time, last quarter, all about the sins of Israel and how God had to bring them back. So the other thing that happened is when they went into the land, they were supposed to get rid of everybody in the land. Right. Drive them out, get rid of them. Do whatever it needs to be done to get rid of them. They did not do that. In fact, they mingled with the people. Well, and even when I saw an exhibit on the Dead Sea Scrolls, they showed all the household idols. So they were mostly faithful, but not completely. Yeah. So they mingled a little bit of okay with not so okay, if we were to take a look at that. So consequently, um, Joshua could not give Israel rest. Consequently, since God is no liar, there must be another rest that remains for the people of God. So let's take a look at <clears throat> Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is either slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we're all one in Christ. But this is the other interesting piece in verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we're heirs to the same promise that the children of Israel were heirs to. It was interesting. I had a, had a conversation with one of my bosses who was Jewish. And he was asking me one day what I believed. And I was able to tell him. And he goes, well, that's what Jews believe. I said, I know. We believe in everything you believe, except we believe in Christ. And so he kind of he kind of chuckled, but um, so we are all one throughout time. So I want to read you a quote from Ellen White, and this comes from Christ Objects Lessons, page three eighty six. No distinction on accountability of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the Maker of all mankind. All men are one, are of one family by creation. All are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, all are brought nigh by his precious blood. Whatever difference in religious belief, a call from suffering humanity must be heard and answered. Where bitterness or feelings exist because of difference in religion, much good can be done by personal service. Loving ministry will break down prejudice and win souls to God. So at times, Hebrew 4 has been an emphasis for the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath. While others have used it to challenge this, the validity of Sabbath rest in light of the fact that there is another end-time rest, neither position reflects the biblical text well. Instead, the text suggests that the end-time focus of God's special rest has been present since her creation and that the creation of Sabbath refer, offers a small weekly taste of the end-time rest. Indeed, the Jews of the Sabbath has been understood to be a small precursor of the world to come. But I would like to suggest <clears throat> that Hebrews is speaking more than just about Sabbath rest. And I want to look at, at some areas where I, th where I believe that this is true. So the rest that comes to each repentant sinner that places trust in God. So that rest that trust we have when we repent, where we give our lives over to God. That trust comes from his grace, his sacrifice that cleanses us from the guilt of sin. In Matthew 11:28, 20, he says, Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Many try to work their way to heaven and are truly weary. 
When we completely give our sins to God, he gives us his ultimate peace and rest. Ellen White says, We are not always willing to come to Jesus with our trials and difficulties. Sometimes we pour our troubles into human ears and tell our afflictions to those who cannot help us and neglect to confide all to Jesus, who is able to change the sorrowful way to paths of joy and peace. Self-denying, self-sacrificing gives glory and victory to the cross. The, promise of God, <clears throat> the promises of God are so very precious. We must study his word if we would know his will. The words of inspiration, carefully studied and practically obeyed, will lead our feet in a plain path where we may walk without stumbling. Oh, that all ministers and people would take their burdens and perplexities to Jesus, who is waiting to receive him and to give him that peace and rest. He will never forsake those who put their trust in him. Also, <clears throat> that belief, that trust, that belief that we see in Romans 8:28, And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And when we're going through trials, I recommend, and I've practiced this in my own life, this is a scripture that I claim regularly, that all things will work out for good. Because sometimes, <clears throat> as we go through life, it doesn't look like you know, things are going to work out for good. But when we look back, if Christ is leading, they all work out for good. Also, Isaiah 52, 2. For you shall not go out in haste, nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Wow. We can trust that God will always be before us. So he'll have our fronts and our backs. He'll protect us. That gives you the ability to lay down and sleep well at night and not have to worry about what's before you or what's behind you. And then number four, the ultimate rest will come when each of us hear the words of Christ in Matthew 5.21. His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joys of the Lord. As we hear that well done, thou good and faithful servant, and Christ opens the gates of heaven into the new Jerusalem, and with his own hand leads, leaves a crown on each of our brows, that will be the true Sabbath rest. So I think I'll give you my final thoughts as well. Sounds great. <clears throat> okay. And I'm t taking this from Testimonies to the Church, Volume uh, 5. And it's talking about us as humans and our frailty. Many make a serious mistake in their religious life by keeping their attention fixed upon feelings and thus, and thus judging their advancement or decline. And I hear this a lot, especially in our small groups, where people are feeling like, I'm not good enough. And I, I, don't, I think all of us have thought, I am not good enough. And that's based on our feelings. Feelings are not a safe criteria. We are not to look within for evidence of our acceptance with God. We shall find there nothing but that which all discourage us. Our only hope is looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There is everything in him to inspire with hope, faith, and with courage. He is our righteousness, our consolation, and rejoicing. Those who look within for comfort will become weary and disappointed. A sense of weakness and unworthiness should lead us with humility to the heart to plead the atoning sacrifice of Christ. As we re rely on his merits, we shall find rest, peace, and joy. He saves to the uttermost all who come to God by him. So let's not think about our feelings and rebuke those feelings when they come before us. Now, I because already know I'll never Christ, be good enough. <laughs> no. None of us it's, will. It's only Christ is the one who does it. We cannot do it ourselves. Exactly. Scott, do you have any final thoughts? <laughs> yes, and you know, I, I'm going to do Psalm 95 in reverse order. We read the second part of Psalm 95 during 
uh, part of our lesson. And now I'm going to read the first part because I thought the, the, the first part is the joyful part. And, and this is how, what it looks like when you do believe. So if you don't harden your heart, this is what you're going to say. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In whose hands are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountain are his also, the sea is his, for it was he who made it and his hands that formed the dry land. So I think having joy and thanksgiving in our hearts is the way we um, ensure that we don't harden our hearts. Thank you. Amen. But I'm going to, Barbara, you had a great segue on your end of Thursday lesson because we actually have similar scripture. I'm actually going to read for final thoughts from Ellen White. It was a sermon she gave called I Will Give You Rest. Um, it was from um, Newcastle, Australia in December 1898. And it's Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy, la and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now notice they mention rest twice there. And there's other parts of the sermon, but I'm going to skip to this section. The abiding rest, who has it? That rest is found when all self-justification all reasoning from a selfish standpoint is put away. The entire self-surrender and acceptance of his, that's God's ways, and all, and all the secret of perfect rest is, his, is rest in his love. We must learn his meekness and lowliness before we experience the fulfillment of the promise. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. It is by learning the habits of Christ <laughs> that self becomes transformed by taking his yoke and then submitting to learn. Giving up the life to Christ means much more than, any, than many suppose. God calls for an entire surrender. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit until we break every yoke that binds us to our, our, our objectionable traits of character. And I would actually just say the Holy Spirit in its fullness. These are great hindrances to wearing Christ's yoke and learning of him. There is no one who has not much to learn. All must be trained by Christ. When we fall upon the living rock, our wrong traits of character are taken away as hindrances to perfection of character. When self dies, Christ lives in the human agent. Acquaintance with Christ makes us long to abide in him and to have him abide in us. So according to this sermon, that is the secret to rest. Abiding with Christ and surrendering everything completely because if you have one thing that you haven't surrendered, it's kind of like Christ's righteousness covers you as clothing, right? But if you have one spot or imperfection that you've refused to surrender to him, he can't cover that. And you have a spot or a wrinkle. So I have to ask you, are you longing for more, more than what you have now? Are you longing for that perfect rest in Christ? And are you willing to give up those things in your life that are not of God? that are at war with the very character of the living God. Until we do that rest that the Lord desires for each of us will elude us too, just like it did for ancient Israel and many others throughout time. So let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you want such wonderful things for us. We can't even comprehend it. We've seen examples of it, Lord, and it seems at times so far away, but you're willing to give it to us. It's so easy. We just have to surrender everything to you. 
and you will make us into the fullness as much as possible on this sinful earth, the fullness of the image of God here and now. Teach us, Lord, to surrender to you. We pray, Lord, that you point out any strongholds or, or cherished sins that we have, Lord, that we cling to, that hinder our relationship with you. And Lord, we ask you to guide us, each one of us here and those watching, that you show us your way, your truth, and your life, that we might experience that rest, that rest that Adam and Eve first experienced on the first day of that Sabbath day after creation with you, Lord, that we might have abundant lives in you and do your good pleasure on this earth, Lord, to truly live as Christ lived. That is our request, that is our prayer, and that is, Lord, our desire for each and every one of us. Guide us to your truth. We pray all of these things to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, Savior, and Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Amen. Happy Sabbath.